Hi everybody, Tom and Z here talking about an architectural learning approach which we've packaged together into what we're calling a learning sprint. And what I've certainly found and you've certainly found over the last couple of years is that the more systematic we make our approach, the more effective it ends up being. What, what's, what's your view on that? Definitely, because when I was studying through my GCSEs all the way A-levels and a university degree now, um, I've always found that if I have a system kind of a framework to go back to, um, to direct me to my, to my studies, to my revision. Mm -hmm. It always makes stuff much more frictionless, much more effective. Yeah, because you're not questioning things. Am I doing the right things all the time? And, and I'm a bit of a bandit like this. What I always want to do, and whenever I've got something which is quite interesting, I want to turn it into a system and give it a name. So you're... <laughs> That's <laughs> your approach. Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's my approach because I think it makes it easier to then share. So, so what we're sharing today is this concept of the learning sprint in the same way that Google took the ideas that had come out of sort of the last 20 years of innovation and creativity and process and working in teams and they called, the, called it a design sprint. They didn't really invent anything new, they just systematized it. Um, we've done what we think is the, the same thing for learning. And so the learning sprint, so the, there's five five steps of the process. Would you like to run through as a quick overview level, what are the five steps? So, yeah. yeah, so the first step is about unpacking. It's about getting our ideas together, what we need, what the resources we require, and that's Unpacking the problem, yeah. Exactly. exactly. Okay. And, and then what do we do? Once we've unpacked the problem, we... Well, there's, we believe there are three types of kind of learning that we need to do, yeah. well, or, or knowledge there is. Yeah. Um, there's the factual knowledge, yeah. which is one big step for us because we need to get the definitions, the glossary down in our heads. Yeah, the and terms, the, you know, the, 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 the fundamental building blocks. You need to know what a molecule is before you can start learning about different molecules. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And then the next bit is about concepts. Yeah. So... Now I know the definition of some principle yeah. in physics, but what's what's the concept behind yeah. it? Where what are the principles that dictate how it works? Yeah, okay. So that's the second. That's the third step. Yeah. And then we move on to procedures because okay. in the end we have to take these facts and these concepts and put them together into some uh, whether whether it will be a problem being posed in an examination or something I need to do. Yeah, on interview or something you need to produce. Yeah, you need to be able to actually apply this, don't you? And then the fifth step is um, putting it all together. What's that all about? It's performance. Um, when we get to our examinations, we need to perform. So yeah. building up to it, whether it's the revision, whether it's the preparation, yeah. it's it's all about getting to that last stage, that final step. Yeah, kind of like making sure you've done a lot of dress rehearsals. So you've got this five-step process. You unpack the problem, then you go through the facts, then the concepts, and then the procedures, and then finally you put, to, put it together in a performance. Should we take a little bit of a dive into some of these areas to help people understand what we mean by this? Um, would that be helpful, do you think? I think so, yeah. So when we let's go back to unpacking then um when i get to a, a subject or a module that i need to study for i need to first sit down and get the syllabus out and need yeah, to know exactly, exactly what do i need to what what is my exam going to ask me what yeah. what are, what what are the topics i need to revise how am for? i going to be examined you know if it's a university level part of it might be a viva if it's at a levels you know is there a practical exam all that sort of stuff as well so, so, it's, so. it's definitely very important to be confident and like sure about what 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 are the things that you required for the exams or what, whatever sort of yeah. thing that you need to perform in the end. And a syllabus is a, obviously a very good place to start. That's what that's examples do. So, But that's not always enough, is it, really? Is this a, I mean, it's a good starting point, but what else do we need to do in the unpacking the problem? We look at um, the resources available. Yeah. So that could be student-built resources, yeah. like the Zenotes. Like Zenotes, for example. Or yeah. it could be videos on the internet. It could be... Yeah. Past paper it could questions. even be textbooks. It could be textbooks. You know, it could be teachers that you've got access to and all those experts sorts of things. In the could area. be yeah, experts in your field. And so talk to me about the Pareto principle. Well, the Pareto principle, yeah, the 80 20 rule. This is really interesting. So, this is um, some Italian dude way back. He's actually looking at um, uh, gardens and vegetables. And he, he'd worked out that it's quite interesting, but sort of some plants were producing significantly more yield than other plants. And he sort of, about 80% of the produce was being actually generated by only 20% of the plants. And he wondered whether or not this was a universal principle. And he looked at lots of different areas and he worked out that 80% of a, of a country's revenue is produced by 20% of the people and these sorts of things. Of course, it's not a hard and fast rule, but the idea is that in business or in life or anything, mostly sort of 80% of the, the, the size of the problem can be um, dealt with in about 20% with 20% of your sort of your your focus and your effort if you do it wisely. So the question is, okay, what is in the unpacking the problem? What is the 80% of the syllabus that is most important that you can focus on? 
rather than saying what are all the tiny little details and that's what Xenos was all about in many ways, wasn't it? It was like focusing on what is this core stuff that is absolutely critical and not worrying about the, the frippery and yeah. all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And when I'm studying as well, I, I tend to kind of go through a filtration process. It, it kind of matches what you're talking about. It's where I, where I look at what... There's this whole canon that I need to study, this mm -hmm. textbook yeah. or whatever. And then I, I obviously get to know quite a few of the basic definitions through different topics. Mm -hmm. There'll mm -hmm. always be that... It's basically, that's the 80%. It's the, mm -hmm. the easier bits, the definitions yeah. I can remember, the concepts which aren't too difficult to... The lowest hanging fruit in some ways, isn't it? Definitely. Yeah, exactly. It's a good way of looking. So, so that's the 80-20 rule, which is a really good part of unpacking the problem. What's going to be most important? What about other things in terms of um, working out how to then, once you've worked out, is unpacking the problem is still about then how to schedule kind of your time and how to build that up and how to work effectively. So, so tell me about working in POMs. We talk about that quite a lot, but... What's yeah. that all about? <clears throat> it's our it's our way of yeah. scheduling, right? So yeah. we, we would say that let's go and do a palm on this or that. And well, a palm again, Italian dude. Italian, yeah, what is it with Italians? Uh, so <laughs> um, well he decided that there, um, he was using a kitchen timer yeah. shaped in the, the shape of a tomato. Yeah. A palm, a Which pomodoro. Is pomodoro, yeah, that's right. In yeah. Italian. So he, it was 25 minutes long. Yeah. And he was able to achieve quite a lot in 25 minutes, mm -hmm. which is quite weird when when I was growing up and I was still growing up but yeah when when we kind of say that oh I did 10 hours of studies or four yeah. hours you know these these numbers the, it's hours it's a unit because an hour is something that we understand and we use it and a timetable says it but actually it turns out an hour is not so. pretty difficult yeah. to when yeah I, I definitely can't just sit down not high level of focus yeah. you know you can work for an hour but how much of it is high quality really neuro activating um, work it's yeah. difficult I know yeah. We with research and there's a lot of work being done on this and it's found that these whether it's 25 minutes yeah. plus or minus but that amount of kind of short time can really put down a target yeah. before you yeah. and go for it and after 25 minutes you'll you'll really achieve kind of like a hundred percent productivity yeah. state. It's massive, and, isn't it? It's exactly, and, and then I, I, the great part about it is actually the break that comes after yeah. that because. So you do like 25 minutes on and then say five minutes off and then and you keep, keep doing cycling. It. But yeah. what's really important is that five minute break really recharges you for mm. the next 25 mm. minutes because I found working in both scenarios and doing that hour and then getting drained and not being able to do much for mm. a very long period of time mm. that's not very effective is it totally I found this with students working especially coming up towards exams you know you could literally work and you'd be it'd be eight o'clock in the evening before you even noticed it if you'd worked in palms and if you don't work in palms you can end up sort of getting to two o'clock or three o'clock in the afternoon and then you kind of you sort of run out of a desire to get back into it, I find. Mm. And it's not that you can't do it, but you kind of, your your motivation sort of ebbs away. So that's part of like then scheduling kind of the period, however long you've got in this, this yeah. five-step Because process. of this kind of, with this new kind of unit we've developed, mm -hmm. um, it just makes it easier to schedule stuff as well. Yeah. So I can then say that I'm going to spend a palm on this topic yeah, or exactly. a palm on this paper or this question even. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to palm it. Yeah, absolutely. And then you, yeah. you, you, start, you sort of schedule stuff and it's, it's not as difficult as like putting together this Gantt chart or timetable where you're yeah. sketching <sighs> everything out. You just put down, you get up in the morning, you put down like, I want to do these three topics or four topics. I'm going to spend two palms, two palms three, on this. Four. Exactly. And, yeah. so, and so on. And you've, you've planned your day out without much difficulty. And this is very important in the unpacking stage because yeah. you want to be very effective with your yeah. time as well. Yeah. So in, in, in essence, the unpacking is working out what you've got to do, planning how you're going to do it, making sure you've got access to all the resources, whether they're, you know, one level, you know, per, personal resources, other people, teachers, whatever, right down to just the syllabus. Okay, so let's move on to the, the first of the, the types of knowledge that we've got to acquire. And the first thing is we talk about facts. Now, some people might say that this isn't the right way to do things. What do you think about your, um, in, in your studies about the importance of kind of learning the language of the topic first before you then try and attack concepts? What do you think about this? Well, we've always been taught by first being given a definition or mm -hmm. you know, at least some sort of basic principle that we require before we actually dive into it. And although some people are hesitant about memorizing mm -hmm. a definition or understanding this, it really does create a big impact. And it's about effectiveness in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if I don't really know the definition or if I don't know the, the really key principles... The building blocks of this whole sort of particular topic. Without, yeah. And then yeah. going on after that, it's, it just gets harder to, to kind of like then understand the concepts behind it. 
And for listeners, the best thing to do is always give an example, isn't it? So let's think about a context. So what would you choose as a context for this? Sentence? Well, I think these three types of knowledges um, fit really well with the chemistry syllabus because okay. it just has great examples of all of them. For example, A-level chemistry. So what would be, say, facts with a, with a particular thing so that would be important? Organic chemistry. Okay. Um, we, get, we, we definitely need to know quite a few facts for that. Yeah. The type of molecules we're dealing with, yeah. whether it's an alkene or alkene. Yeah. Some um, classification, some definitions. Why some is structures. this? Excellent. How to draw stuff. All yeah. That. yeah. So these are things that are facts and we want them to be yeah. on our fingertips. We want them to be there. Is this facts. kind of your times tables type things? The basic building yeah. blocks of a particular topic. So you're not wasting time sort of like, yeah, yeah. Especially when you get to the more difficult aspects of it, mm. where you're answering mm. questions or you're trying to explain a concept, you need these things on the tip of your tongue. And this isn't the sort of thing that you could do learn by exploring at this stage, really, is it? This is just like this is the raw material, kind of the vocabulary of the understanding comes from learning these facts. It's a glossary. It? Yeah, exactly. Brilliant. Okay, so then staying with or organic chemistry, if you like, let's move on to the next step, which is the conceptual knowledge. So, what what might that be in this analogy? Well. I think it would be something like the reaction mechanisms in, mm. in, a, in a chemistry or organic and chemistry. And why reactions happen in the first place yeah. and how they then work and all that sort the of stuff. The whole idea yeah. about like yeah. energies and all that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, so that, that fits quite well with the concepts mm. because then you have this, this very abstract idea, right? Because yeah. reaction mechanisms don't really have... We're, we're talking about this without context. Mm -hmm. We're just giving mm -hmm. this kind of mm -hmm. more abstract mm -hmm. principle yep. that chemical molecules follow this sort of route. And so that's a concept because yeah. it can be applied to so many different yeah. scenarios. Yeah, yeah. So, so, you, so you then got things like alkanes and alkenes that you've learned about, and you're thinking, well, okay, how might I change an alkane to an al alkene? What might I need to do? And then the reaction mechanisms can help you understand that. And you say, oh, if this sort of thing happens in this particular region, re region of the syllabus, for this reason, because maybe it's to do with conservation of energy, minimization, principle of least action, all these whatever nice things, you could then, you're saying you could then apply it to a different area because yeah. you've understood that it is a concept that could be applied to many different situations. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when we're talking about the types of knowledge, I think this would be the most difficult one to acquire as well yeah. because it's, it really is very abstract. It, yeah. it requires a lot of thinking and again, going back to something like the palms and talking about whether you can do an hour of study or not. Mm -hmm. Things like a concept may take a long period of time. It's not something that you can sit down and just memorize. Or of course. It's really, when you get it in your head, that, that it's like a toolkit that has to really sit in your head before you can actually apply to it. If, if we think about at this stage, you know, what particular approaches would work, my, my experience is always about analogy and going from what you actually know already and know well to what you don't know. So, for example, if you're trying to talk about energy conservation, well, then you might talk about just, you know, allowing a ball to be free to move on a hill. It's always going to roll down to the lowest, you know, energy position position energy state now we know that because we experience it so we can actually observe it and then we yeah. can apply it what yeah. other in your um kind of experience are good ways to get people to understand concepts you know are there any other things that you can think of or general approaches I and mean, we, we have a bunch don't we in kind of our uh, in our toolkit but are there any things that you found for understanding concepts that worked well for you visualizations yeah so especially now when i'm studying math and our general yeah. relativity professor is trying to explain this kind of completely far not idea to us. It's drawing, he's drawing us diagrams, yeah. he's showing us how a yeah. manifold looks like and this and that. But the great thing is that pictures speak, yeah. right? Because yeah. pictures whatever, are worth a thousand words, as they say. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cheesy, but yeah. Yeah, it is true yeah. though, and we can see it because uh, he can write yeah. 10 boards worth of explanation or he can mm -hmm. just draw a picture and make yeah, sure exactly. obviously the picture has to be very effective and this is yeah. very important as well but it's 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 visible right it's in yeah every teacher really goes back to the board and draws a diagram to explain something so when you're learning as well if you can really kind of get those ideas and create your own i, I it might not be creating your own diagram but like getting mm, it to if you can diagram yours. out the concept in in its sort of processes because presumably most of the things we're talking about involve some sort of movement you know any sort of concept is involved some sort of movement or interaction or reaction so presumably some sort of diagram can show yeah. that yeah and just because we are talking about a lot about sciences let's like this the same idea can be applied to something like economics as well yeah, right of course because of course. well we're talking about movement but we yeah. don't mean physical movement we no. mean like movement yeah. in general it could be yeah. like Change. Change. change some sort of change I mean presumably there is there are very very few 
things that people are going to learn where they, they're totally static and don't involve any sort of like Well, then they yeah. kind of go back to the facts. Right? Correct. Right. Absolutely. Concept. So the third thing we talked about earlier is procedures. So how would procedures be different from, say, concepts? Well, it's tying in the previous two. So it's the facts and the concepts put together mm. really form a procedure. So organic chemistry again. Um, when I know the facts, the reaction mechanisms, sorry, when I know the reaction conditions mm -hmm. and I know the types of molecules involved, Mm -hmm. And I know the concept, which is the reaction mm. mechanism. I then tie those two things together, yeah. and then I can create a procedure out of it, right? So, for example, I might be posed a question about some sort of molecule which needs to be transformed yeah. in a certain way, and I follow those these concepts in fact to uh -huh. then go to the next step. And the procedures are things which you could mm. understand the concepts themselves quite well, and you could understand the facts quite well, but unless you've kind of understood the procedures and worked out how that works and learned them, it's going to be difficult to derive the procedures from first principles isn't it so you need sort of practice in those procedures no, you know how to do this is almost like how to do the questions isn't it really it is a bit, yeah. Yeah. yeah and so tell me a bit about reverse learning because that's okay. a very important aspect when we when you talk about procedures right yeah absolutely so 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 the concept of, of of reverse learning is really well if we start at the very end and say this is the result so we will pose a question and then we'll look at the answer and then we'll say okay well we've got the answer just before we had this answer what did we have you know what was just before this and what what are what are the units that are given again staying on sciences a little bit so if the units are given in this what does that actually mean and then so working backwards why we find this very helpful is because if you can um it's a bit like the difference between if i if i memorize you know uh, four times five four times five is 20 right four times five can uh, forwards can only be one thing all right, four times five is 20. But if I start off with 20, I've got much greater insight because 20 could be four times five, could be five times four, could be 10 times two, all sorts of different ways. So what reverse learning does, if you go, oh, this is the end and work backwards, you've got so many more sort of different ways that you can think about how this all works. So what that avoids is it avoids you learning just the procedure, just one way and not really deeply understanding it which is how a lot of stuff is taught in schools. They actually teach you how to do a type of question, which is great, but then you learn it. Whereas if you're learning backwards, you're sort of unpacking it backwards, step by step, and we found that it's very effective. It is, yeah. So just to clarify, though, that you can maybe put more insight into this as well. We don't really mean that students work backwards from a mark scheme in the sense that they just copy a procedure. No. Right? Because that's quite, it could be easily misunderstood like that as well. Um, when we're given, we're, when we're looking at a mark scheme answer, and working back to the question, we're we're really putting much more effort than just you know yeah. going forward. It's a lot more effort because you have to think, well, how did this? How has this arrived at? Rather than okay, so for for example, and and, and Cambridge and Oxford use this approach all the time. They say, here's some problems. Just try and see how you get on with them, and then we'll go. Um, and that's reverse learning at a slightly higher level. We'll go through these once you've had a crack, and then if you can kind of work these out just from kind of the questions and just the answers and seeing uh, how you can fill in the gaps, then, then together in discussion, we can see how all the pieces fit together. If you just learn things in one direction, you can have the danger of missing the deeper, the deeper nuances of a particular topic. We could spend quite a long time talking about procedures, but um, we want to kind of wrap up this, the, this session. So let's move on to performance. What's performance all about? What would you say? Well, it's taking everything we've done so we've unpacked our problem, we've identified the types of knowledge we need to acquire, we've worked on those, we've quite, kind of acquired them as well, and now we need to perform. We need to either go into an exam, go into, into, mm. an, into an interview, and do it. So to get to that stage, we need to revise, right? So yeah. there are lots of things that we... So scheduling was very important at the beginning, and now it's putting that into, mm -hmm. into play right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, the performance is really, you know, what you want to be doing is you want to be, it's, it's like the athlete preparing yourself for the event. So it's kind of a stress rehearsal. But in the performance, what you want to be doing is doing like the kind of the altitude training approach. I'm reminded of um, a chap from Cambridge <laughs> who actually used to do, he knew he had three hour exams coming up. And so he would actually do three hour exams next to the radiator in his room in the summer knowing that that intense heat and stress of being really hot and having to do things would prepare him so that when he went into the actual exam, he'd be a lot more comfortable. Yeah. Sounds um, like altitude training. It's, it is, that's exactly what it is, altitude training for, for, for the actual um, performance of doing an exam or whatever, in the same ways that you would prepare anything. But if you were preparing for an interview that you know would be quite difficult, you wouldn't prepare 
with something which is much easier. You'd always over-prepare, you're prepare yeah. with something which is much harder. So that's the whole, whole idea of performance. So anything else to add? We've got this five-step process of the learning sprint, which is could be done in five days, uh, it could be done in one day, it could be done in six months, it doesn't really matter. But the idea, you unpack the problem, you go through the facts, the concepts, the procedures that you need to master, you put it all together with some altitude training, the performance, and that's that's kind of pretty much it. I mean, any any last word to sort of wrap up? Well, what do I do? How do I get involved with these things? Yeah, exactly. So so what we're trying to do um, through sort of architect your learning is, is really say, well, let's give as much of this advice about the particular techniques to people as uh, through our website. Um, so we're working on putting these together, you know, talking about reverse learning, how to actually do it, talking about what the POMS is so people can actually do it. And we're also... Kind of providing that toolkit to them, right? Exactly. We're giving them the toolkit of all the techniques and the tools that they can apply in their own learning. But we're also thinking of running some workshops. Aren't we? We've talked about the workshops. What might that look like? Well, it could be, again, like the number of the lengths of days doesn't really matter, but we could go out anywhere and just kind of talk through these problems and really put them into context because right now mm -hmm. we're talking a lot in abstract and mm -hmm. it's, it's it doesn't really it might not be making sense to our listeners right now but putting it into a context of an exam of a topic mm -hmm. of a subject it makes a lot of sense and suddenly what we're and these toolkits applied would make a lot of sense yeah. as well and so a workshop might be we might pick something like the example like a level chemistry and say okay let's see in one five-day period how much we can actually get through unpacking the problem, the context, going through the facts, the concepts, the procedures, and then practicing with some performance. And we do something like a pre-test and a post-test. Now, the point is not necessarily just to really do well in A-level chemistry. It's so, oh, now that I've got these tools, I can apply them to anything, whether I want to develop my career on the side, learn you know, web design or Ruby on Rails or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. Like, I think the last thing I would want to say is that what we're trying to achieve through this kind of concept and idea and trying to teach this to people isn't really about it's it's much bigger than just exams right mm. it's it's much mm. further than that if you can get if you can understand how to become an architect of your learning you can become an architect of, of many things you can become an yeah. architect of your career of your yeah. life um it's just about what we're seeing right now in the world with more and more startups being developed you know with yeah. more people industries being dis disrupted stuff, everything's yeah, exactly. just changing yeah. we just need to be much better and faster at learning stuff we need to yeah. be more effective at it I think one of my favorite um, downloads that I have, you know, I, I, you know what I do, I sort of like sit and, you know, just wait for stuff and get downloaded good ideas every so often. But this concept, you know, the ability to learn new things fast is the currency of the future. And that was one that I thought was quite interesting because if you can have the ability to really quickly define the scope of what this is through unpacking the problem well and then build, you know, a structured way of superficially actually getting the ability to do quite well and actually perform through those processes in any particular context, you're probably going to do quite well overall in a, in a rapidly changing world, right? We'd hope so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Brilliant. So that's enough from us. Um, hope you enjoyed it and check out more info on our website.